Tonight's film, The Defector Escape from North Korea, is a snapshot of the thousands of other defectors who have fled over the years, some reaching to safety, some not. Tonight, I'm joined by Chris Kim, the executive director of Hand Voice, the largest Canadian organization advocating for improving human rights in North Korea. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Magdalene. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So first of all, tell me what Hand Voice does exactly. Hand Voice is a, a Canadian organization. Uh, what we do is we uh, really focus on um, bringing awareness about the North Korean human rights issues, but also doing uh, projects, some on the ground in North Korea, and, and a lot revolving around North Korean refugees. Mm -hmm. um, we're based here in Toronto, and like you said, we are Canada's largest organization on the subject. So when you saw this documentary, I mean, we were saying riveting uh, as I watched, because I, I mean, I don't have a connection to the North Korean community. I didn't know the extent of the journey many people take to flee this country. I, I was holding on to my seat. Is this accurate? Is this an accurate picture of what people face day in and day out? Um, absolutely. Uh, essentially, what the defector really shows, the documentary really shows that um, coming out of, of, of North Korea is, uh, is, is a trial and it's a tribulation all onto itself. It has risks and some of those risks aren't uh, clear once you, you escape. Even once you're in China, there are still many risks that North Koreans face. 80% um, of all North Korean defectors are women in China women face sexual slavery and trafficking. If they have children with a Chinese national, their children won't have rights within China, so they won't have education, they won't have medical care, and then there's always the risk that the Chinese government will try to find them out and return them to North Korea where they are sure to perhaps enter a prison camp and, and, and perhaps even come to death. So, so many questions out of that statement. Why women, why 80% of women are fleeing North Korea? Well, uh, it's a man's world in North Korea. Um, the government has jobs for men, and so they oftentimes, North Korean men, are tethered to their jobs. Um, their official record, uh, record keeping, whereby they can't play hooky and escape uh, from, uh, easily from their work unnoticed. Mm. But for women, it's a little bit more liberal. Uh, they, they aren't tethered to a job uh, set by the North Korean government. They have a little bit more flexibility in terms of leaving North Korea, coming back unnoticed. Mm -hmm. And actually, they are the pioneers of the black market movement in North Korea as well. Wow. While men go to their official jobs, women go to these black markets and sell wares and, and goods in order to make money to, end, uh, to make their ends meet. Wow. And then another point that you made is that if uh, North Korea is found in China, that sometimes they're sent back. What, why would that be? Why wouldn't somebody see that they're trying to flee this country and not send them back? The Chinese have a very uh, long-standing relationship with North Korea. Um, you know, they are essentially the two communist nations left in that area now that Russia has become uh, a, a, a republic. Um, and so they, they have a, a long-standing history. The Chinese also don't want to incentivize a massive outflow of refugees. Mm -hmm. They want North Korea to stay a buffer zone between itself, South Korea, and the United States Army in South Korea. So China has a vested interest on many fronts in just keeping North Korea in the status quo. And to that end, whenever they have refugees that come in, um, they have, again, in order to keep that status quo, a vested interest in returning them to North Korea, mm. despite the, uh, the well-documented hardships that'll, that any North Korean will face if they're repatriated. Let's talk about that, because the documentary doesn't go into great detail of what life is like in North Korea. Paint a picture of what you've heard um, over the years about what life is like and why people are fleeing. Okay. The uh, United Nations uh, commissioned a commission of inquiry uh, to, to go on a fact-finding mission about North Korea. The report was released February of 2014, and what the report essentially says is that this is one of the worst uh, human rights abusers, uh, the regime that is, in, in uh, all the world at current. Um, they found that the North Korean regime actually perpetrates crimes against humanity against its citizens, mm. and they are a t totalitarian state that has complete domination of every facet of their citizens' life. Um, that is the kind of repressive regime uh, that, that exists today, and the North Korean people are the ones suffering for it. In terms of why people leave North Korea, uh, 
it's a mixed bag of, uh, of, of reasons, but essentially, in 1994, uh, North Korea experienced a famine. It was a famine that lasted uh, two to four years, and it wiped out maybe um, a million to three million people, mm. uh, which was about 5% of its population. So initially, in the 90s and in the early 2000s, a lot of people left North Korea because they, their basic survival rights were not being cared for by the, the North Korean government. This is a communist nation, so it's not a nation where um, you go to a market and you buy your wares. This is a place where the, the, the communist regime is supposed to provide uh, your goods, your food for you. Mm. But slowly that, that narrative has changed to now where the North Korean economy is doing better. It's not doing well by any stretch of the imagination, but it's certainly doing enough to feed its people. Coupled with the black markets, people are now getting enough to eat. However, now people that are escaping, they're escaping for reasons that are more political in nature. They simply are finding out the truth about what is going on in North Korea relative to the rest of the world. They are aware that their South Korean neighbors are doing well, mm -hmm. and South Koreans are genetically identical with North Koreans, and yet you see that they're five inches taller on average, they have better lives. And so now the people are leaving, they're leaving for political reasons, they're leaving for in search of a better life and in search of happiness and not just their, their basic survival rights and needs. And so are you saying that North Koreans didn't know that there was another, like for lack of a better term, greener grass on the other side? Are, is that what you're saying, that they didn't realize there was this other world? outside of their gates? Yes, so the North Korean regime has a uh, full monopoly over the uh, press in North Korea. So North Koreans only hear typically what the North Korean government wants them to. Every house has a, has a radio, and that radio is only set on one channel, and that the, that's the North Korean regime's official propaganda channel. So for many years when, for instance, radio uh, and, 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 and um, print press were the only means of communication in North Korea, uh, and people didn't know how to reset or retoggle the radios. Um, they'd only get information from one source. Hmm. But now, what we've seen is more defectors uh, have, 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 sh have uh, told us stories about how they bought modified radios, and, and things are being smuggled in, such as um, USB key readers, DVDs. So now they're seeing South Korean DVDs, South Korean soap, soap operas, um, American movies, and they're seeing a completely different style of life, different from their own. And I think uh, that is really expanding the minds of North Koreans and, and giving them incentive to search for a better life. When you're talking to some of the refugees from North Korea that make it to Canada, what are some of the stories that you're hearing of uh, life, what life was like for them and also what life is like now as they're seeing this whole other world? Um, life was hard. Uh, I, I remember speaking to one, uh, one friend, a young refugee here in, uh, in Canada, and they were talking about, for instance, when Kim Il-sung died. Mm. Uh, Kim Il-sung was revered as a god in North Korea, and when he died in 1994, the entire country went into this mass panic, mm -hmm. and people were wailing and crying and heaving and sobbing. And he also, you know, not really appreciating the gravity of what was going on, saw his classmates acting in this dramatic fashion, and his body just kind of automatically went into that mode. Mm. We've heard other stories of people who uh, have, have actually not felt any attachment to Kim Il-sung or Kim Jong-il when they died, yet they were so afraid for their lives that they forced the emotion just so they wouldn't be noticed. Um, so a mixed bag of different emotions, but certainly in the past it was, it was very dramatic and there was a big uh, a lot of reverence for the dictators. Mm. But now what we're hearing is more and more refugees are coming out and they're saying that the country and the people are less concerned about the, the iron tight rule of the, the new leader, Kim Jong-un, who's the third of, a gener uh, of three generations of dictators. And he's also 32, he's very young. He doesn't quite have the same stature as his dad and his grandfather before him. So I think we're starting to see, see the iron grip kind of slip a little bit. Hmm. We only have a few minutes left, but I want to know what can Canadians do? I mean, this is an issue that continues. I think the defector is a great tool to have conversations like this about what's happening in North Korea. But there are many people watching saying, okay, I've seen this documentary, what can I do? How, how can we get involved and help? 
Well, the first thing is always just to keep informed, to keep yourself engaged in the issue, um, and and by showing your uh, showing that this is an important issue, we send an important signal to civil society organizations such as On Voice, as well as to our government to say this is an issue that Canada should stand against. In terms of the government, the government right now has a controlled engagement um, policy, which basically means that we uh, put and abide by sanctions that have been put on the, the North Korean government by the UN. But, but perhaps we can do more. Perhaps we can have a discussion with the government to do more, such as, for instance, opening up new resettlement routes. Mm. Um, the whole Syrian crisis is going on right now, and certainly they, is, they deserve a lot of attention. But perhaps we can also think to other refugee groups that need that resettlement support, North Korea being one of them. And finally, in, in Han Voice herself, we have certain programs that assist North Koreans. For instance, we have a program where we're raising money to send USB keys into North Korea. Each of these USB keys has Wikipedia in Korean. It has uh, documentaries and movies. And what it does is, again, we're trying to expand the minds of North Koreans. Mm -hmm. We ultimately believe that change can't come within North Korea unless North Koreans can view that alternate reality. We also have an internship program where, uh, where we bring over a very talented North Korean refugee from South Korea. And what they do is they do a three-month internship in Toronto. They learn their grassroots. They learn some English. They learn how to rub elbows with different people in the Toronto community. And then they go and do a three-month internship on Parliament Hill with a parliamentarian. And through this process, they also learn to kind of harness um, harness kind of their lobbying powers. They learn to walk the halls of power in Ottawa and gain confidence. Each one of our pioneers, it's called the Han Voice Pioneer Project, each one of our pioneers have, have met the Prime Minister and they've met uh, various ministers in government. And it just gives them that necessary confidence so that they can stand on their own two feet and be their own powerful advocates for their own people in North Korea. Raising up the next generation of leaders. Exactly. Thank you again, Chris, for your time. My pleasure, Magdalene. After the break, we are going to hear from Lisa Pack. In January of 2015, the senior pastor of her church, Reverend Lim, while on a routine trip to North Korea, went missing. We will hear from Lisa as to what has happened to Reverend Lim and find out if she thinks they will ever see him again. We'll be right back. <laughs> 